All right, so good afternoon, folks. Um, hope you're all doing well. I know this is a busy time for all of you in terms of uh, midterms. How many of you have like three this week or over last? So you've got five classes. I'm assuming everybody has like uh, five midterms. So uh, you can stay as long as you'd like, uh, or if you feel like uh, you've, uh, you know, I've covered the stuff that you're interested in, you can leave uh, midway through the lecture, totally fine with that. But I do wanna talk a little bit about the midterm exam first. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the study guide uh, that I released. And then I'm going to go through just some of the highlights of things that are likely to appear uh, on the exam in some capacity or things that people have asked me to talk a little bit more about. Uh, so let's talk about the exam details. Uh, just I know I've mentioned this before, but uh, to make sure everybody's on the same page, the exam is here in this classroom at this time uh, on Wednesday. Uh, so as you probably noticed today, it seems much less crowded in the hallway. Uh, the class that's before us isn't meeting in person this week. Uh, so what I've suggested to my proctor and the teaching assistant is we'll get everything set up just like an exam, you know, like an end of the year exam. We'll get things set up like 2.15 or something uh, so that I can make sure that the doors will be open at 2.20. Uh, but we'll start the exam at 2.30. It'll be there. You can just uh, we'll go through a little bit of uh, a question and answer. If there's anything specific about the exam that you need to know, uh, we can talk about it. We'll wait till 2.30 for everybody to get started. Uh, some of the things that you probably noticed on the guide that I posted, uh, when you come in, just keep your stuff with you. Uh, you can sit where you normally sit. There isn't really enough room for everybody to spread out. It would be nice if you could spread out a little bit more. Obviously, like I'm kind of looking back there, there's a big empty gap. Uh, in the middle back there. So feel free to sit back there if you'd like, but I know that we're gonna have uh, some cases where you're sitting next to someone. We'll make sure that if you're sitting next to someone, you have different copies of the exam uh, just to keep everybody on the same page. But the questions are gonna be the same. So everyone has the same uh, uh, the same 60 questions. Did I say 60 questions? Yeah, everybody has the same 60 questions just in a different random order. Uh, these will be multiple choice exams, and I'll go through uh, multiple choice questions. I'll go through some examples of the kinds of questions uh, that will be on the midterm. In these example questions, I don't think any of them appear in exactly this way on the midterm, but there are some that appear uh, that are similar to this. They might have different choices, or they might uh, be worded in slightly different ways. Uh, so you've got two hours to complete the exam. We'll start at 2.20, and you can finish uh, at 4.30. Uh, bring pencils and an ID. I'll have some extra pencils, but I don't know how many extra pencils I'll actually have. Uh, so make sure you bring a few just in case. Uh, and anything else you would need to take an exam. So if you need to have extra water, it seems reasonable. Uh, if you want earplugs, if I were taking an exam, I would totally want to have earplugs to make sure that I can't hear noise around me. Uh, go ahead and do that. Try to remember to bring your ID. That's officially uh, something that we're supposed to have. Uh, if you've forgotten your ID or if you've lost your ID in the mid uh, in you know between today uh, and uh, Wednesday, don't worry about it. Uh, we'll have some other form of ID. I kind of recognize a lot of the people that are in the class already, so I think everything should be fine. But uh, it's best to bring your ID uh, with you. Anything else you need? Tissues, lip balm. Don't forget lip balm. Uh, that would be. <laughs> I would forget lip balm and I would not be able to take the exam if I didn't have lip balm there to apply uh, every few minutes. Um, make sure your phone's set on silent, obviously keep it in your bag. During the exam, obviously people can leave uh, to use the washroom. Ideally, it's only one person at a time can leave the room, uh, unless it's like an emergency. I wouldn't want there to be an emergency in the classroom. So uh, just let uh, me or one of the proctors or the TA know. Uh, so we can keep a track of uh, who's in and who's out of the classroom. Any questions before uh, we move on uh, to today's content? Uh, so what kind of questions? Let me give you an example of the kind of questions. I don't know exactly how many of each type of question uh, are going to be on this 60 question multiple choice exam. Uh, one thing I can tell you is that there's a fairly decent uh, dis distribution of uh, questions for the topics that we've covered. So there'll be some from each class and each uh, topic that we've covered. So there are some really straightforward questions that you'll, you'll recognize. So a question like this, the primary motor cortex is located A, in the cerebellum, B, in the occipital cortex, C, toward the rear of the frontal lobe, or D, in the midbrain. What's the answer? How many people feeling C? 
Yes, that's the right answer. Good, I was hoping. Uh, yes, you should be feeling C, right? So primary motor cortex, uh, which is that motor strip, uh, is at the rear or the back of the frontal lobe. So it's at the back of the front. Uh, and remember, it's right across from that central fissure uh, from the primary sensory cortex, which is in the parietal lobe. So that's one of the things that you should know. And that was listed on that study guide. Know the, the main four uh, structural lobes of the cortex, uh, some of the functions that are associated with all four of them. So this is what I would call a factual recall or recognition. So it's just a basic fact, right? I mean, it's a definition. Uh, it's remembering what the frontal lobe is, what the primary cortex is, uh, and where they should be. And I would consider this to be a relatively easy question, right? You don't have to infer additional information. You should, you should know this information. Um, here is what I would call a moderate uh, difficulty question, and you'll see why I call it moderate difficulty in just a minute. Which of the following neuropsychological techniques or methods does not provide information about the amount of dynamic blood flow to various regions of the brain? Yes. E, both A and B. So the options are CAT scans, MRI, PET scan, and fMRI. So the answer that you suggested is E. How many people are feeling E? He feels pretty good here. So maybe this isn't as hard as I thought. The reason I would suggest it's moderate difficulty uh, is it's just worded in a way that makes you have to pay attention a little bit more, right? So it's which of the following are not, uh, do not provide. So if you read it too fast, uh, you might uh, answer something uh, slightly differently. So make sure you read each question carefully. Unlike the quizzes, which were uh, not proctored, but on OWL, but also had that terrible linear format where you would answer a question and then couldn't go back. A midterm exam that's written, you can just reread your questions as many times as you like. Uh, so you can uh, go back and check every single question. So maybe moderate difficulty. It's not a hard answer, uh, but maybe it's worded in a way that makes it a little bit more challenging. Um, here's a reverse definition. The fact that people can identify letters more rapidly in words than in nonsense strings of letter demonstrates the influence of, this is an easy one, linguistic structure, bottom-up processing, top-down processing, or template matching, which is the answer here. Yeah. Top-down processing, excellent. So uh, this is by reverse definition, this is just kind of like the Jeopardy answer, right? You get the whole definition and then you have to pick uh, the thing that you're needing to define. Uh, just as an aside here, uh, there, was an, a, there was a question from uh, one of you about word superiority effect. This is an explanation for word superiority effect, which is one of the terms that I wanted you to know that was on that study guide. So top-down processing. A model of letter or object recognition, which assumes, or should it be that assumes? Now I don't know. Which sounds correct? I think you think I'm fine, however it is. All right, I actually, read, when I read it out loud, it sounded like it was grammatically poorly structured. So anyway, it doesn't matter because this one won't appear on your exam, so I won't feel bad about it. A model of letter recognition, which assumes that an object or letter is broken down into a set of component features and then identified by matching this set of components to representations in memory is a, a structural description model, B, template model, C, feature detection model, or D, geon model. This I would consider to be fairly difficult because it differs from what we discussed in class, but it concerns a similar topic and based on what we should have covered in class and what you should have read, you should be able to come up with the answer. So what are you feeling here? C, feature detection model, excellent feature detection model. So that's, this is essentially how we describe feature detection theory. Now we talked about lines, right? And pop out effects and colors. Uh, you should assume then if anything is broken down into features, then identified by matching them, uh, that this would be the answer. Furthermore, you might also notice things like template model. That's a model that might appear briefly in the textbook, but we didn't talk about it in class. So sometimes you'll see dis uh, distractors, uh, which maybe if we didn't talk about them, you should think twice about whether or not they would be the right answer. That was a good tip. Uh, this is extrapolation and inference. Uh, there's a fair number of these kinds of questions, and you probably saw some of these on your quizzes, uh, where you're asked to think about an example 
and then decide what the answer would be based on what you've learned about cognitive psychology. A participant has just been in an experiment involving dichotic listening. So you gotta know what dichotic listening is to answer this question. Of the following, the participant is least likely to remember A, whether the unattended channel was spoken by a male or a female, B, whether the unattended channel contained non-speech, noises or speech, C, the semantic content of the attended channel, D, the meaning of the words presented on, should be in, uh, the unattended channel. What do you think is the correct answer there? D sounds pretty good, right? And this is a little, tr it's a little bit tricky. Uh, because the semantic content is something you're not supposed to, that's the one thing that we tried to talk about in dichotic listening, right? Semantic content doesn't get in. The key thing is semantic content doesn't get in through the unattended channel. Of course it gets through the, uh, the attended channel. How else could you shadow the thing if it wasn't being attended to? Does that make sense to everyone? So extrapolation and inference, we didn't quite talk about it. Here is an, ex wow, that's taken up a lot of space there. Uh, here's extrapolation and uh, inference difficult. A participant is asked to memorize a series of word pairs, including the pair heavy light. A participant is asked later if any of the following words had been included in the list memorized earlier, lamp, candle, spark, and light. The participant denies having seen any of these words recently. This is probably because... Now, remember, they did see the pair heavy and light, and now they're seeing this list of words, lamp, candle, spark, and light, and they say they didn't see any of those words, so they don't remember seeing it. Does that make sense? So why? The learning context does not provide enough adequate support for perceptual encoding. That's a statement that says almost nothing. <laughs> I mean, that could be the answer to any possible question, right? Uh, the learning context does relatively little to encourage deep processing. Well, I don't know if that's the right answer, but that's certainly not true, right? Because heavy and light, that kind of does encourage deep processing, doesn't it? Because it encourages the opposite. What was memorized was the idea of light as a description of weight, not light as illumination. How many are feeling kind of good at this point? Because that seems like it could be a plausible answer. Uh, the learning context led the participant to think in terms of opposites, while the test can led the participant to think in terms of semantic associates. Well, that actually also sounds plausible, doesn't it? Um, so the correct answer in this case is what would have been inferred uh, from the context. Yes, the context uh, is in terms of uh, semantic associates. These are also semantic associates of the opposite type. So it isn't really the case that it was excluding semantic memory. Uh, this would be the best of the possible answers. So this would be a really challenging question uh, because some of them seem plausible. Answer number one seems kind of plausible, but not really, it doesn't really say anything. B is probably not correct. C and D is a really tough choice. I would suggest C is the better answer because it explains directly why they wouldn't remember this because they remembered something else about it. When the spreading activation happened and the elaborative encoding happened, what likely occurred was a particular meaning of the word light, not the one uh, here because now what's encoded uh, is a, or what's being asked to be retrieved is a different meaning of the word light. So that's probably the best possible answer. Yes. So if the question has started in doing where heavy and light is like all those different words, and we give examples and this is more of a broad overview, would we then be wrong? There's a you could word a question like this where D could be correct. Uh, and so that, that could also be a plausible explanation. Uh, so this is giving us why uh, they denied seeing these particular words recently. Now don't panic, there aren't too many questions like this on the midterm. Uh, these are the hardest of the midterm questions. Any questions before we go on? Okay, so I wanna just, well, I'm gonna take you through a couple of things which concern some things that will be asked about on the midterm. Uh, so these are also things that people have asked me questions about, but let me just say briefly, you all have a copy of the uh, study exam guide. Uh, I. Sorry, I couldn't get that out this weekend. I uh, didn't get a chance to finish it until uh, Sunday evening. 
Uh, so what that exam study guide should tell you is the things to focus relatively more on. Uh, not every one of those topics will be asked about on the midterm, but all of the questions on the midterm will be drawn from that set of topics. So what that means is that if I talked about a study like that Ethnir's study specifically, uh, where we talked about category learning, uh, it was the one that one of my students had done just as an example, I didn't put that one on there. I probably won't ask any questions about that particular study. Uh, so particular studies that I mentioned, uh, I'll ask questions about them. Uh, particular topics that I've talked about, I, I will ask questions about them. You'll also notice that I don't ask about uh, formant transitions in acoustic uh, perceptions. It's because there's no questions on format transitions. So this hopefully will help you focus a little bit and narrow down what you should spend a little bit more time uh, studying. Yes. So the question is, will I ask uh, questions about names and dates and who said this and who said what? With one exception, uh, I haven't asked a uh, question specifically to ask you who said this uh, or this, this, you know, here, describe a study, who did this study. I did mention specifically something about James's definition of uh, attention, but in the, I think in the um, question, it probably says something like, what's the definition of attention by William James? The other exceptions are when I talk about a specific study like Loftus's study on eyewitness memory or the Dees Rodiger McDermott paradigm on false memory. But the question there will be about the study and the effect and the finding and the theory and not just remembering the name of the date. Does that help? Yes. Uh, so if you didn't hear, the question is, will I be asking any questions uh, that are directly from or directly relevant uh, to the textbook? Uh, so the answer is, I will be asking questions that are, that are included in the textbook if I've talked about them in class. Uh, so I won't be asking about specific findings uh, from the textbook unless I've talked about them in class. Uh, so again, you can use that, uh, that information to help. Uh, use your notes to help you uh, decide which parts of the textbook you might want to reread or review. And then use this study guide to help you focus a little bit if you want to spend a little bit of extra time on certain topics. Uh, does that help at all? All right, so I'm going to go through now for roughly the next... Oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Didn't, like, talk about a study on the review sheet, like, it won't be on the exam. That's right. Like, Tinkle Paw won't be on the exam. Tinkle Paw will not be on the exam. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's absolutely right. So I list, so I listed the, I listed the ones that are going to be now behaviorism, uh, and maybe some of the shortcomings of behaviorism could be on the exam, uh, because I've listed that as a topic that you should know something about. So I tried to list specific things on that study guide, uh, occurring, you know, according to where I would like to ask questions about on the midterm. Does that help at all? Yes. The tennis thing? Uh, I don't think I have a question about that one in particular either. You guys remember the tennis example. That's, there's only so many things I can ask about, right? I got 60 questions and I wanna ask about the core topics. Uh, a lot of the studies are part of the core course, uh, but some of the studies also provide extra context and explanation. So let's go through a few things. And these are things that I'd like you to make special, um, you know, make sure you uh, know the details of. Uh, and then if you've got a few extra questions afterwards, uh, feel free to stick around for a little bit after, uh, or feel free to take off and study for whichever other one of a number of midterms you probably have this very same week. It's nice that the weather worked out to be super nice and want you to stay outside uh, just when you need to study for midterms inside. Uh, so all of this is just on one screen because you already have the slides. What I've done for a lot of these next slides is I've taken like six slides and crammed them all into one like a poster. Uh, just to remind you of the key findings, I'll ask at least a little bit about this. And remember, there were two questions here. Uh, so one is a study on laptops and note taking. And the first study found that when people were asked to take notes on a laptop, as opposed to taking notes by hand, uh, they wrote more. So they had more uh, writing. They had greater verbatim overlap when they used the, the laptop. And they did pretty well on factual recall questions but the laptop note takers didn't do as well on the conceptual questions. 
So it seemed as if taking notes on a laptop as opposed to writing them didn't allow people to involve the same kind of elaborative encoding that they might if they were writing the notes down. That was the explanation that people who write are more likely to abstract, right? They have to, they've they got to go slower. Uh, they're writing fewer words because they're going by hand. And so they tend to be a little bit more abstract uh, and therefore get a better sense of the concepts that they're trying to learn. So this kicked off an entire series of, uh, you know, attempts to replicate it because it's kind of a surprising finding, right? If you use a laptop and you write more and you write more verbatim, you actually remember less. It's counterintuitive. Turns out it didn't seem to replicate very well. So remember, we out talked about a replication study uh, where, yes, the uh, words replicated, and yes, the verbatim overlap replicated, and yes, the no difference between factual items replicated, but the one important interesting thing that didn't replicate was the better performance on conceptual items for handwritten note takers. So if I ask a question about the laptop study, uh, make sure you notice whether or not I'm asking about the original study or the replication study, and make sure you pay attention to whether I'm asking about factual recall, conceptual recall, uh, number of words, or verbatim overlap. So, um... When you like distinguish between the original study or the ones that came after, would you distinguish by saying like, oh, I'm talking about the first study? Yes. Or would you say like the main study? Like, so yeah. it could be either, but more than likely um, for any of these examples, and certainly for this example, I'll make sure it's clear which study I'm talking about. So when I've asked this question in the past, I've often asked, according to the study on laptops by Mueller and Oppenheimer, or according to the replication study on laptops uh, by X, I forget the names of the authors. So probably I shouldn't ask about that one if I don't remember the names of the authors myself. Uh, yes, the question will say whether I'm asking about the original study or the replication study. Is that good? Um, now, of course, from that same first two weeks, the first two classes, there's also lots of questions on the history of psychology. I think that stuff's pretty clear, so I'm not including it in the uh, review session. One thing I did want to include in the review session is just to remind everybody uh, to be clear about what these four main areas are, where they are, and what they mostly do. So questions about what's mediated by the frontal lobe or the frontal cortex. So things like uh, language uh, production, speech, movement, emotions, problem solving and reasoning, uh, everything from the prefrontal cortex, which uh, does this planning to the uh, top of the uh, back of the frontal cortex, which is that motor uh, area. Uh, knowing what the parietal lobe does, which is movement, uh, uh, orientation, recognition and perception, knowing what the occipital lobe uh, does, which is the visual processing or primary visual cortex, uh, and knowing what the temporal lobe does, which is uh, sort of auditory processing memory once you look at the subcortical structures. So we had several different slides which showed different areas of the brain. You should be familiar with all of those, along with the dorsal and ventral streams. Uh, this is a perfect, now I don't know for sure, if, I can't remember for sure if I used uh, a question just like this on the midterm, though I have in the past. This is a great example for one of those kinds of questions where I ask you to do some inference. Like if someone had damage here, what kind of pattern of results would you expect? If someone had damage here, what kind of pattern of results would you expect? Or to do it the other way around, to describe a pattern of uh, specific impairments and then say, based on what you know, this most likely indicates damage in the dorsal or the ventral pathway. So I have used questions like that in the past. So good, so far so good? Great. Um, some of these subcortical structures uh, are important to know. And the ones that are important to the are the ones that are listed in bold. Uh, this is another thing I wanted to highlight. And the reason I use this particular slide, sometimes the images have extra information in them, uh, like the mammillary body, which we don't talk about at all in this class. Uh, and I haven't asked any questions about, and I haven't provided any information about these particular areas. They happen to be on the figure uh, that's, that I've selected or that I've done a Google image search on or something like, wherever the figure came from. Uh, it often includes information that we don't need 
uh, to talk about. What we are going to talk about are the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. Those all relate a little bit more strongly to cognitive processing, in particular the hippocampus with its uh, emphasis on memory consolidation, amygdala with its emphasis on emotional processing, uh, thalamus with its emphasis uh, on sensory uh, integration, uh, and the hypothalamus, which we haven't talked as much about, uh, but it does uh, mediate behaviors uh, uh, that are sort of primary uh, functional behaviors. Does that seem clear? This is a good one, and this is one that I think also we had a few additional questions about, and I listed this as a topic you should know something about uh, on your midterm study guide, uh, and that has to do with this path, the visual path. In this case, it's labeled the path from eyeball to brain, uh, but we've talked about this in lots of different contexts, a flow of visual information, uh, visual pathways, and so on. And this includes a lot of information on this slide. It's a great slide, right? Uh, it has left and visual field, it gets uh, the idea of the optic nerve, where that's located. Uh, we talk about how the visual fields are uh, preserved on each side of the cortex, uh, so that the left side of the right eyeball and the left side of the left eyeball all end up on the left side of the cortex. And it shows why that information combines and then enters into the brain and primary visual cortex. This is one that we've talked a little bit extra about too, which is this idea of receptive fields. And remember receptive fields, uh, and I think we spent a few different lectures sort of reviewing this material. Uh, receptive fields sort of are the big, these are the beginning of the information processing in the visual system. Uh, these go all the way down to the very retina itself with rods and cones. Uh, and those rods and cones in uh, clusters can activate uh, these bipolar cells. The bipolar cells have receptive field. The receptive field is how we describe the this neuron or this cell's preferred pattern of activation. If this cell determines uh, that the light is coming from the sensors in the center and not surrounding it, that cell fires. That's an on-center cell. And the off-center cell does not. So all of the different receptive fields that we've talked about use that same principle of visual computation. They're looking out for a particular pattern of energy uh, or a pattern of activation. And when that pattern of activation is present, that cell fires. Otherwise it doesn't fire. Yes. Yes. Um, which stage versus the I know that was a good question on the first place. Yeah, for sure. I will do that. I think that's the next slide, as a matter of fact. So, uh, so the question was, can we go over the idea that at each step? So the one thing I wanted to mention, and just to highlight on this slide, is that this idea of receptive fields uh, is a principle of neural organization uh, that underlies a lot of different kinds of cells. So these bipolar cells have receptive fields, but other cells have receptive fields. Each cell that has a receptive field, is the receptive field is defined by the uh, neurons or the cells that feed information into that cell, right? So it's a receptive field of the things that it's connected to. Uh, the information is out here, enters into the retina. These uh, cones have, uh, they either get activated or not, and they feed into this bipolar cell, which has a receptive fields of rods and cones. And these go further uh, along the line. So the next uh, step are ganglion cells. Ganglion cells have receptive fields of bipolar cells. As those bipolar cells uh, either fire or don't fire, uh, and they fire or don't fire based on something that's in the center on or center off, uh, these ganglion cells have receptive fields. Cells in the lateral geniculate nucleus uh, and the primary visual cortex, like the simple cells and the complex cells, also have receptive fields. So each one of these cells has a receptive field that points to the, the, the layer of cells below it, the layer of cells that's feeding the information in. Does that seem, does that seem clear? Clearer? And 
from this network. So did that answer your question? Did it help to answer your question? A little bit. So let me let me rephrase it in just a slightly different way. So for the receptive field, remember each one of these cells is uh, looking for information that's consistent with its receptive field. It takes information in from the layer that is one step closer to the outside world. So if you're a bipolar cell, the step that's closest to the outside world are rods and cones. If you're a ganglion cell, the step that's closest to the outside world are the bipolar cells. If you're a lateral geniculate nucleus cell, the layer that's closest to the out, that's next closest to the outside world are these ganglion cells and so on. Uh, so you're getting information from things that's one step closer to the outside world. Did that help at all? Or did that just make it equally slightly less? I hope that helped. If not, feel free to raise your hand and go back. Uh, and I can always try to answer questions again. Uh, this is the last time I want to bring, this is the last one that sort of depends on receptive fields. Um, this is the alternative way to think about these receptive fields and how they work. So we talked about the first, the first slide was about receptive field as a principle. The second slide was about receptive fields as they link together in networks. This slide is about the computational advantage and information processing advantage of those receptive fields. In other words, now that you've got receptive fields and you've got a network of cells that have receptive fields, what can you do with them? What kind of information can you encode and what kind of information can you then feed to the next layer uh, of uh, visual processing? Well, you've got receptive fields in your, uh, in your retina and lateral geniculate nucleus, right? So this is what comes in from the outside world. It activates rods and cones. Uh, these rods and cones can then uh, activate these more complicated cells, which we're gonna call simple cells because they are networks of individual cells that store one piece of information and include some lateral inhibition. So an, an array of cells with lateral inhibition in the visual system called a simple cell, allows you to encode information about orientation. So these are lines of specific orientation. The simple cell doesn't care which, and it doesn't know anything about the direction that they're moving. It just encodes information about, hey, there looks like there's some kind of an edge here. They also don't know how long the edge is. It's just an edge of a certain orientation. That's all the cell can pick up is orientation. It doesn't know about movement. It doesn't know about length. It just knows about orientation. Information is also fed to a second layer, uh, which is in this primary visual cortex or the primary occipital cortex, uh, which has no lateral inhibition, uh, which means that it can pay attention to or it can respond to edges that move across this visual field. So that gives you in the complex cell, orientation and directional movement. So that means there's one cell sitting out there. And when something that looks like this, a line of this orientation moves in this direction, that cell's entire day is made, right? Uh, that cell says, this is exactly what I've been waiting all day for, a line in this orientation moving just like this. This is the best day ever. Uh, because I get to do my job. And that's all that cell does is it looks around for that information uh, in, uh, being fed to it. And there's other cells that look for this line moving this way and this line moving this way and every other orientation of line and every other direction. There's cells for all of them. And when the information fits what the cell wants, uh, it fires. If the information doesn't fit, those cells don't fire. So that way, every possible orientation, every possible direction has some representation. Yes. Yeah, so the, there was a question on the quiz. So the, was just asked was a question on the quiz. So there was a question on the quiz, uh, which was uh, to distinguish between complex and hypercomplex cells. Uh, and I think that was the one for which there was a duplicate question. Uh, so the answer for that particular one on the quiz, I think was about complex cells, uh, but the, Slightly more complicated cell is the hypercomplex cell. And the hypercomplex cell fits the definition that you had, uh, which is 
it responds to lines of a particular orientation uh, that can move in a particular direction and are of a certain length. So they have a, an inhibition at the end. So that cell uh, responds to three pieces of information. So visual input that has orientation, direction across its visual field, uh, and a certain length of that line. All of these are working simultaneously. Yeah. So, so hyperfocal cells do basically everything the other cells produce plus another thing. Yeah. So they're getting information from this uh, complex cell, uh, and they're paying attention to this third, uh, this third uh, dimension uh, of end stop. So yes, they're getting information about uh, orientation. Uh, they encode information about uh, directional movement across, and they encode information about. Uh, whether or not this line ends at a certain point. So three pieces of information. Simple has one piece, complex has two pieces, hypercomplex has three pieces. And the order of information is uh, orientation, movement, and length. All of this works simultaneously in your visual system. Does that seem pretty clear? Yeah. So yes, that's a good question. These simple cells are found uh, in the lateral geniculate nucleus. There are also simple cells found in the uh, primary visual cortex also. These cells, complex, hypercomplex, are only in the visual cortex. Yeah. So good question, where in the visual pathway are uh, simple cells? So simple cells in the visual pathway occur in two places. Uh, in the lateral geniculate nucleus first, uh, there are also simple cells in the primary visual cortex, which is V1, uh, which is where the information first enters into the occipital lobe. That's before it splits into dorsal and ventral stream. And these are the basic features that you need to encode things like shapes, objects, letters, and words. Yes. Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. Every cell responds to one direction. Uh, you just have lots of cells, each one responding to a different direction. So if, an, if you have information that has multiple directions relevant, uh, you'll have different clusters of cells or different networks and arrays of cells being activated uh, simultaneously. Yes. Hypercomplex cells are found in the primary visual cortex. Uh, also, yeah. Yes. Like, if orientation is in um, simple cells and then in yeah. after, is like color information and like light of multiple as well? So, great question. How is color information? Uh, encoded. Color information is not encoded in these particular cells. There are other cells that respond to the color information that's passed uh, from the rods, or, sorry, from the cones of different uh, length. So cones have different uh, lengths. They respond to a light of different wavelengths, uh, which means they respond to light that corresponds to different colors. Uh, that's also encoded as a feature, uh, not as a part of these cells, uh, but it's a single feature uh, that would be running in parallel to this also? That's a good question. Yeah, so primary visual cortex, uh, simple cells, uh, same as the lateral geniculate nucleus, simple cells, they respond just to that orientation. Uh, so they're just active when uh, any edge is detected of a, of a particular uh, orientation. The important thing to remember from all of this is that this is happening uh, in your visual system in parallel. So all of this happens simultaneously uh, because every object has lots of lines and edges to it. Uh, you need a lot of cells to be doing redundant information. It, would be, it wouldn't be a very good visual uh, object detection system if you had only one cell for one possible line. So you need lots of different kinds of cells uh, that can all encode information at this particular orientation. Uh, so lots of cells doing work simultaneously so that you have a whole connected network of cells responding uh, to this information. Okay to move on. <laughs>
Uh, you should know about the recognition by components theory. Uh, this is that Gion theory. So this is one of those cases where oftentimes a question will refer to the theory by the researcher's name. Uh, so I would not ask who came up with Gion's uh, and the answer would be Biederman, though that would be a really easy question. Um, I might refer to it as Biederman's theory on object recognition. Uh, you might also see it referred to as the recognition by components theory. Both of those uh, terms could be used, and I indicated that on the study guide. Uh, so you should know the steps, right? You've got edge extraction, uh, and you should know these non-accidental properties. Uh, know what a non-accidental property is, uh, and maybe how to recognize it, and the idea that objects are recognized by comparing them uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the geon representations, these uh, 36 basic shapes, or these uh, volumetric uh, primitives. Uh, this is one that came up a few times uh, in terms of uh, question and answer uh, by email or on Teams. Uh, and that's the difference between these models of attention. So we've moved now from uh, brain to uh, visual perception uh, to object recognition. Uh, then the next step, uh, the next kind of uh, step in this uh, uh, information processing uh, stream is where the information gets in. We've got an early selection model and a late selection model. Uh, two later selection models, one was the attenuation model and the other one is called a late selection model. Uh, all three of them make predictions. Uh, none of them is, none of these models are exclusive. Uh, information about, uh, that we've learned from this early, early selection model, this broadband model, uh, is still relevant. Uh, things from the Treisman attenuation theory and the later uh, selection theories uh, are also relevant. But the way they work has to do with where the selection of what you're paying attention to is made. Uh, so the early selection models assume that when you're trying to decide what to pay attention to in the world, uh, you make the selection early. Why it's called early selection, right? So you make the selection early before you know what something means. That's the key distinction. So, yes. Uh, so the question is, is the attenuation theory the best of the three? The attenuation theory seems to account for most of the data uh, from the three, and it seems to be the most flexible. Uh, the least flexible model seems to be the early selection bottleneck theory, but even some of that information or some of what was discovered in that uh, theory is still pretty relevant. Uh, so the key things to remember are where the, you know, where is the bottleneck? Where do you start to screen things out because you can't pay attention to everything simultaneously? Uh, you can do it before you know what something means, which is broadband's theory, which says uh, only stuff that's you know, physical in nature. In other words, the sound of a of someone's voice or the color of something uh, or the texture of something. So you don't have any meaning. Uh, you just have basic perceptual information. You can use that to decide what to pay attention to uh, and everything else uh, can be screened out. So that's an early selection model. You only take in what you need. Uh, so imagine you're standing on one side of a door, all the information is coming in and you only need to pay attention to a particular piece of information. You only let in the door what is the basic physical characteristics of what you want to then process later. So somebody's handing you information, you don't read it first, you just look to see is it the stuff that uh, is a certain sound or a certain uh, shape uh, or a certain texture. Then you look at it more closely. So no meaning gets through. In these later selection models, the assumption is that some meaning gets through uh, and they differ only in terms of what gets through. In the attenuation model, the suggestion is that you use some of what the early selection model suggests as a filter. So you would use those physical characteristics as a filter, and you would amplify the message that you want to pay attention to based on physical characteristics, and you would turn down the information that you don't want to pay attention to also on the basis of physical characteristics, but you wouldn't block it completely. And that's the biggest difference. In broadband's theory, you use physical characteristics to block the information you don't want to pay attention to. In the attenuation model, you use physical characteristics to turn down or de-emphasize the information you don't want to pay attention to, but you still let a little bit in. And that way, if you need to switch after the fact, 
uh, you can still do so. So if there is some important relevant information in the things that you're not supposed to be paying attention to, you can quickly switch uh, based on semantic content. And that's something like that cocktail party phenomenon. The late selection theory uh, suggests, well, we don't really use the uh, physical characteristics to screen stuff out at all. Everything gets through. And then once the information is processed, at least initially with some semantic content, then an attentional system, like maybe the system in your working memory system, the central executive, uh, would uh, make a distinction about what you're supposed to be processing further. So this assumes that everything gets through and then you select the message or you select the stream of information uh, based on its physical characteristics and its semantic characteristics as well. So one is early, one is later, but it has some early filtering. Uh, and the one is uh, late, it has no filtering, but it's based on selection, yes. So yes, can I repeat the late selection one uh, one more time? Uh, rather than filtering the information out, like the early selection model suggests, we filter the information late, last, right before we decide to do something further with it. In other words, right before we decide to commit it to memory or right before we decide to elaborate on it or let the information spread. So the late selection model suggests we can use physical and semantic information uh, to screen things out after it's been processed initially. Yes. I think they're all distinguished. Yes. Yeah, so I'll refer to a specific model. Uh, now you might, the, the questions that could be challenging uh, would be questions where I might describe a pattern of results and ask which of these models best accounts for it. I don't know if I actually have that question, but that would be an example of a more challenging question. Yes. Sorry, I couldn't hear. So an example of a, so can I give an example of a physical characteristic? Uh, the physical characteristics, uh, the best examples come from that dichotic listening experiment uh, where people can switch back and forth based on characteristics of a person's voice that are not connected to the meaning. In other words, the pitch uh, or the timbre of a voice, uh, the location of a voice. Those are not connected to the meaning, uh, but they're physical characteristics because they're closely connected to the physics or the acoustics uh, of the sound. Uh, there's definitely a question, uh, for, uh, for sure there's a question like uh, on this Brooks experiment. Uh, and I think, was there a question on this on the quiz too? I think there was, just because I love this experiment so much. I always ask about uh, this kind of stuff because this is kind of the bridge too between the attention theory uh, and the working memory theory that we talked about. Uh, and this is this model that suggests we've got different pools of attention, right? We've got visual attention, uh, visual spatial attention, and we have uh, sort of this verbal uh, attention. And so it would be helpful. This is another one of these cases where I sometimes use the name of the researcher closely associated with this experiment. But if I ask the question, it would be of the type of question, according to the experiment by Brooks, or uh, based on this, you know, here's a pattern of results. According to Brooks's study uh, on attentional pools, what would you predict? That kind of thing. So I wouldn't ask you to say, who did that experiment with the big letter F? Uh, the answer would be Brooks. I won't ask it that way. Uh, but I might use the researcher's name as a cue to help you remember the entire study. Uh, and remember, this is a study where we had two different encoding conditions, uh, verbal encoding, where you have to memorize a sentence, and visual spatial encoding, where you have to memorize an image and imagine something happening in visual spatial time in that image. So either going through a sentence, a bird in the hand is not in the bush, or watching this asterisk trace around a shape. Uh, so one is visual spatial in nature, the other one is verbal in nature. And then participants, remember, had several ways to respond. They could either respond uh, to the question noun or not uh, by pointing, uh, or they could respond to the, is it in the extreme top or bottom uh, by pointing, tapping, or saying. The word saying is covered up by this uh, little screen here, but there it says, saying yes or no, right? Uh, and the idea here was that if, the response mechanism is using the same kind of attention and working memory resources as the encoding condition, 
there should be some interference. So if you're imagining that F tracing around, that's visual spatial. And if you're trying to point to the yes and no in different locations, also visual spatial, there's a little bit of interference and there's some conflict and that should make it harder to do the task. And this is the missing table uh, that didn't appear uh, when I tried to talk about it in class, right? So this is the table that would suggest uh, referent, in other words, what you learned, sentences, pointing, this is the mean output time in seconds, pointing is fast, vocal is slow. If you look at diagrams, which are visual spatial, and you look at pointing, pointing is slow and vocal is fast. So you can see that reverse pattern of results. Uh, the, more, uh, the more they overlap, the more interference there is, the longer it takes you to do that task. And the reason is you're switching between the two pieces of information. Uh, that's, this is the cost of attentional switching. Uh, when you're doing two tasks that use the same kind of working memory resources and the same kind of attention. Yes. Yeah, tapping is uh, just a, a movement. So it's not visual spatial. It's kind of the in-between uh, case. In a way, it's kind of the control condition uh, because it shouldn't be very difficult. You just, you've got to respond yes or no and you're just tapping left or right. Uh, you should be able to do that without much dependency uh, on a visual spatial representation. However, if you have to look on a sheet of paper, find the yes or no, and it's not even in a straight column, uh, that requires you to think visual spatially in a way that just tapping back and forth does not. That's a good question. And so you see the patterns, slower, faster, fastest, fastest, slower, well, it's in between, uh, and then uh, slowest. Good. Moving on to memory types, this is just the big slide that we covered. So all of these would be things you might be expected to ask questions on. Relatively speaking, there are more questions on memory than anything else. And that's because we had more topic on memory than just about anything else. We had several memory uh, lectures and we had a whole quiz basically just on memory. So you'll probably see more memory questions, but that's because we had a lot of different things to say in memory. We talked about the difference between explicit and implicit memory, uh, sometimes called declarative and non-declarative memory. Uh, we talked about at, within explicit memory, episodic and semantic memory. Those would be things you should be able to define, but those should also be things you should be able to come up with examples of. Hold on for a sec here, let me close this. Does that mean our And I think we gave examples, and on the next few slides, I have a couple of specific examples. We gave examples of all three of these uh, here, classical conditioning. We talked about priming. We talked about procedural memory. Uh, we talked a little bit, but not very much in terms of specific examples about this perceptual learning. Yes. That's a good explanation. So perceptual learning is an example of getting better at something without much conscious effort or awareness that you're getting better at. Uh, closely related to priming, but not exactly the same thing. So if you've ever played a, uh, a video game that requires a lot of uh, hand-eye coordination and perceptual movement, right? Detecting different images uh, and maybe making certain movements and you get a little bit better at it. Uh, as you continue to play that. That would be an example of perceptual learning. You get better at doing things uh, visually, perceptually, uh, and making motor responses. Why is it like related to priming? So it's related to priming in the sense that things that you've done before influence how you do things uh, in the future. Uh, priming tends to focus on a specific uh, stimulus. So the presentation of a single word. Priming also has both physical perceptual characteristics, but also conceptual types of priming as well. Does that help? We, you should definitely know the basic modal model. This is, uh, what, yes. I will in just a few slides actually. So if the question is example of priming, I've got two good priming examples coming up. Um, so your basic modal model of memory, this gives explanation. So within this entire model, uh, you should know about the how it answers things about the serial position effect. Um, you should answer uh, things about uh, maintenance rehearsal. You should know about short-term memory, long-term memory. 
in this older version of memory, the idea was things come in through this uh, early analysis, which we sort of described as uh, iconic memory, right? So basic uh, visual memory. And then it enters into this primary short-term memory system. And only through that can the information enter later into long-term memory or information that comes out of long-term memory. When you start thinking about it again, you retrieve it back into short-term memory. Uh, so it's this conscious uh, in between. This is stuff coming in. This is stuff that's stored. And the short-term memory system does the maintenance rehearsal. Uh, it does the uh, activation and sending to long-term memory. It also holds information when you bring it back out of long-term memory. The modal model used the term primary memory. Most of us use the term short-term memory and Badley's model in particular used the term working memory. Uh, not entirely equivalent because each model had slightly different characteristics, uh, but they're all trying to accomplish the same function. This working memory model, which we, I think, spent a little bit of time for two different lectures talking about, uh, has these different components, has four main components, a verbal working memory component called the phonological loop, a visual working memory component called the visual spatial sketch pad, an episodic memory component called the episodic buffer, and then an attentional control center called the central executive, which allocates resources and determines which one of these attentional memory pools uh, is managing uh, the current information. And these map on to the long-term memory stores uh, equivalently. Yes. Uh, all of these actually would be considered. So that's a good definition of what these uh, systems are. So the question was, is the episodic buffer a relay system between uh, short-term memory and uh, episodic memory and long-term memory. So yes, that's exactly right. Each of these would map onto something that's stored uh, in long-term memory, but in different ways. Uh, so verbal information, uh, your language, for example, and names for things uh, has a heavy emphasis on the phonological loop. So when you're thinking, when you're listening to somebody or having a conversation, or you're trying to remember facts, that's a v verbal working memory experiment. Uh, if you're remembering the sentence in Brooks's case, that's all happening here in this phonological loop. When you're remembering information uh, that's visual spatial in nature, so the F in Brooks's uh, imagery experiment, that would be something that is, the image is stored in your long-term memory. Uh, he says visual semantics here, but this would be something that is visual in nature. Uh, and then you remember it or think about it or work on it uh, consciously in that visual spatial sketch pad. Uh, when you're remembering things that in concern you at a certain time, uh, then you're encoding information about yourself and encoding information about the temporal characteristics uh, using this episodic buffer and mapping that onto your episodic memory in long-term memory. Does that seem pretty clear? Yes. That's a good question. So how long can you rehearse something? It's, there's no clear answer for that. Uh, and one of the reasons is it depends on what you're rehearsing, right? Uh, you can chunk information to help you uh, learn, uh, learn more to increase your working memory span. Uh, you can uh, rehearse something, some things you can only rehearse once uh, and you'll remember it. So if it's something that's really memorable, uh, it activates a lot of things. Uh, but of course, there's no such thing as only rehearsing once. Uh, as soon as you, uh, activate information in long-term memory, uh, and then remember it again, it continues to strengthen that association, uh, which is a form of elaborative rehearsal. Yeah. Well, you're bringing stuff back from your working memory and then refreshing it in working memory, strengthening those associations, exactly. Um, we talked, of course, about elaborative encoding and the levels of processing. It's, it's almost guaranteed that there'll be at least one question on this because we spent a lot of time talking about it. Uh, and this is the idea that things can be encoded with different processes, shallow processes, meaning uh, the physical characteristics, uh, sensory processes, and deeper processes, which refer to the semantics of something that you need to learn. Uh, and the basic idea was that when we focused participants' attention and processing capacity on the characteristics of the word, they learned 
uh, the characteristics of the word, right? So if you just ask people to think about capital letters or not, they just think about the fact that they saw capital letters or not. They don't think about what the word means, which then translates into uh, less good memory. So case, uh, it took them longer uh, to respond uh, for, uh, uh, for latency and their performance was not as good, only 20% correct. When you had to pay attention to the meaning, your performance went up. So uh, your, the, your ability to recall that information or recognize that in, information was improved when the encoding task forced you to think about what that information meant. So that's a level of processing effect. Uh, we also talked about priming effects. Uh, we talked about conceptual priming and perceptual priming. Uh, conceptual priming is where the meaning, like seeing the word bread first, makes you recognize the word butter faster. So meaning influences uh, your ability to recognize a word, as opposed to seeing the word tree and then smile later on. There's no connection between the two, and so you're not necessarily any faster. We also talked about perceptual priming, seeing this version of the word water presented in a previous uh, exposure makes it easier for you to recognize this degraded form, to identify it as the word water. So both of these are forms of priming. One is based on the meaning, the semantics. The other one is based on the form of the actual uh, stimulus itself. This makes sense, right? Because when we're seeing something, uh, we expect to see it again. Uh, it's, there aren't many occasions you have where you see something once and never again, right? When you see something in front of you, whether it's a word or a person or an object or a food, you're likely to keep seeing it. Uh, if you're sitting at, the, sitting at the table getting something to eat, you continue to see what's in front of you, right? So every time you see something, it makes it easier for you to see it again. Uh, that's essentially what priming is. Uh, it's a way to predict what's coming next and to make it easier for you to encode and identify things based on your direct experience. Um, we talked about false memories. Uh, this De Schrodinger and McDermott paradigm, 100% there's going to be a question on this uh, because we spent a lot of time talking about it, right? Uh, and it's one of those foundational studies uh, in memory. It shows that people do falsely recognize things based on strength of association. So when you see a list of words like bed, rest, awake, tired, dream, wake, snooze, blanket, doze, slumber, snore, nap, peace, yawn, and drowsy, but you don't see the word sleep, and then later you're asked to recognize the words that you may have seen, you're likely to falsely recognize having seen the word sleep even when you didn't because you activated it when you read all of these other words that were pointing to sleep. All right, so that's a spreading activation explanation for a false memory. Yes. Uh, so the question is repetition priming. So repetition priming uh, can refer to either of these two paradigms. So the idea of repetition priming just means when you see something and then you see a repeated exposure of it later, uh, the strength of association between those two things determines the strength of the priming effect. So you can see repetition priming that's perceptual and repetition priming that's conceptual. Does that help? Okay, good. Also, there'll probably likely be questions on Loftus's eyewitness testimony uh, study. Uh, so some of these might be the factual recall questions. Some of these might be the extrapolation questions where I give an example of something and then I ask you to sort of predict what the outcome might be. Uh, both of these two things, by the way, D. Schrodinger and McDermott uh, and the uh, eyewitness testimony really lend themselves well to that, right? You can construct an example and say, here's what certain person experienced. What is the best, most likely explanation for them? So I might ask you to think about uh, a result based on what you know about this. But based on what you know about it, uh, there were distortion and intrusion errors. The distortion errors in this particular case uh, that when they were asked with a word that semantically seemed to suggest a little bit more of an aggressive action, like smashed, they tended to distort what they remembered as the speed. They tended to remember them going a little bit faster. And there was an intrusion of new information uh, for those same subjects. They falsely remembered seeing broken glass when there wasn't. Does that seem pretty clear? 
I'm going to get through all 11 lectures in one hour. <laughs> I feel like I could have just, this is like four slides in one. I should be doing this all the time. Imagine how much faster we could get, we could get through stuff. It's going to be a lecture hack. I'm just going to, four slides at once. Yes. I, yes, I did cover this at the beginning. Uh, on the study guide, there's only two questions that, that I might ask at all, anything at all about, uh, and that would be things like categorical perception and the McGurk effect. I didn't ask any, it turns out I just didn't get around to asking any questions uh, about the ear uh, and about things like the cochlear, uh, uh, the, the cochlear ducts and the basilar membrane and all of those things and the formant transitions. Uh, it's important and it's probably gonna come back a little bit later when we talk about language in a little bit more detail, uh, but I just didn't have time to work all that in. So yes, the, the question was, it wasn't on the study guide. If there's a topic that wasn't on, that we talked about that it doesn't show up in that study guide, I'm not gonna ask questions about it. So that's a way to sort of focus. I mean, that said, there's still a lot of information, right? I say, know the four lobes of the brain. There's a lot of stuff there, right? Or know about the working memory system. There's a lot of stuff there. Uh, but what you'll see on that study guide is those are sort of the core topics that we spent the most time talking about. And that's what the exam is supposed to be about. Yes. Nothing about the ear. There are no questions about the ear. Uh, so just forget the ear. <laughs> forget that I even mentioned the ear. There's no ear uh, on this exam. Is that good? I only got 60 questions. There's only so much I can ask, right? Uh, it's not that the ear isn't interesting. It's just that I just didn't happen to ask any questions about it. Um, okay, there are questions on these though. Uh, and this is also kind of confusing and complicated. And, uh, but that said, this should be a little bit fresher, right? Because we just talked about this on uh, Wednesday. Uh, and uh, so we just talked about these three models. Uh, these are models of knowledge representation. Uh, the first is a model called the H Collins and Quillian uh, hierarchical model. Uh, and the idea is that information in your semantic memory is stored in a hierarchy. Uh, and it accounts for things like those property verification tasks. So a canary is, can sing, you would recognize that fact faster than a canary can move around uh, because these things are stored closer together in semantic memory. They're close associates. An animal can move around is a close associate, uh, but it's not a close associate to canary. According to this model, in order to verify that information in your knowledge representation system, you would have to answer the question, a canary is a bird, a canary is an animal, an animal can move around before you know whether or not that fact is true or not. An alternative model suggests that uh, spreading activation rather than a hierarchy works within a network uh, and so facts are connected uh, to each other in terms of the, essentially their proximity. Uh, this particular neural network would suggest that color information is stored semantically close, right? So when you activate one color word, you activate other color words at roughly the same time. Uh, we also talked about this propositional network, the idea that network spreading activation within a network also encodes information in terms of propositions which are the smallest unit of information, that's either true or false. All of these models are, they share characteristics, right? They share the idea of spreading activation. Uh, the propositional network is the one that uh, is the most sophisticated. It's also the one that makes predictions like the fan effect. Uh, and it has specific ways to handle things like type and token distinctions. Uh, we also made a distinction between concepts and categories. We're now getting to the very end of this complete overview, uh, suggesting that a category is a group of things, a behavioral equivalence class, and the concept is a mental representation. And then we spent some time talking about, well, what are those concepts, right? Uh, concepts can be things like uh, information stored in a hierarchy. And we suggested if you store conceptual information in a hierarchy, uh, some of these levels are not very specific. Plant versus animal versus vehicle, it's not a very specific level. There's a lot of information there. Uh, some of the information is really specific, uh, like the different kinds of dogs and different kinds of cats. And what we suggested is that when people identify objects, when they think about concepts, and then when they 
uh, learn words, when they learn concepts first, when they make connections between concepts, uh, we tend to do it at a basic level. And the basic level is this uh, abstract level, the most abstract level at which objects form the same shape, have the same motor movements, they have parts, uh, they name them faster, you list them first, children learn them first, and so on. The basic level is where we do most of our conceptual thinking. Then finally, at the very end of the class, uh, we talked about uh, some models of conceptual representation. And we said there are kind of three that seem to be viable options. One is a classical view, which relies on definitions. Uh, and although it is a model that should work really well, because it gives you the right answer if you have the right definition, uh, it turns out that for most concepts, uh, most of the defining features are hard to describe. Even when they are easy to describe, most people don't use them. And that gives rise to things like typicality effects uh, and um, uh, things like graded structure. And so we suggested that perhaps uh, rather than representing things as needing a definition or fitting a rule, most people represent concepts around family resemblances, uh, things like a, a prototype to describe the central tendency, the most frequently occurring features of a category, or a set of exemplars that are connected because they're similar to each other because they share features. Is that the final slide in this slide book? I should have had a final slide that said, good luck. I don't know why I didn't do that. Um, I guess I just sort of ran out of steam at the end here when I was putting everything together. So um, I'll say good luck. And then anyone who wants to continue to ask questions, I'm happy to take questions uh, until about 4.15, if that's okay. Uh, you had a question. Absolutely. So the question was, can we go through this uh, set of models a little bit more? I'll try to talk loud. So if you, if, you know, if you feel like this is enough and you want to take off, that's totally fine. I'm going to continue to record things anyway, uh, but I'll keep answering questions as well. Hierarchical model. Uh, in this case, the key insight has to do with information at the higher level of the hierarchy. Everything that's true there would be true by thing, would also be true of members below that level. I know, I'll wait for a second. All right, so just to make it easy, if you thought you would leave in the next minute or so, I'll just wait a few more minutes to answer questions. This will be sort of our, everybody can stand up and take a break time. Hello. Yes. Yes. Yes, okay, good. Perfect. And then I have another question. I've got a list on there. No problem. Yeah, yeah. I heard someone was asking about the tennis. So what would he mean about the consciousness yes. experiment? Yeah, I don't have a question on that and on the, the exam. The, the central, uh, the tension switch, you know, like they, they're doing two math problems. I don't think I have a question about that specific study. It does, oh, okay, I see. Yeah. But it does link to the automaticity. But it does. It's so good to know. Yes, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted to ask quickly, just like the difference between these two. Um, so complex cells, uh, orientation and motion in any direction, uh, as opposed to uh, orientation in directional motion. So the difference here is that uh, the complex cells encode orientation in a specific direction oh. rather than motion in any direction. Kind of move it everywhere. That's right. Gotcha. And sorry, this is a stupid question, but for simple cells, what do you mean by orientation? Just like the shape and size? Just the, just the angle of the line. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much. Sure. Hi. Hi. No, wait. Like, will this show questions like about a diagram and ask for the diagram, for example? Like, I show like a hierarchy of diagram. I just like, oh, what well, I asked for. I don't, yeah, I don't have any diagrams. Oh. So it would just be questions specifically. Sure. No, what's those? All right. So it looks like we we're down to about half. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'll wait another minute. And then for anyone who wants to continue to ask questions, uh, we've got about another half an hour uh, and I'll continue to answer questions, but I can just do them for everyone. Uh, and so that way, if you have a question, I'll answer everyone else's questions. So your question was, 
explain these again, right? Uh, so there's a question whether or not I would explain uh, this uh, set again. All of these models have some overlap and some shared characteristics. Uh, they all use spreading activation. So each one of these models makes the assumption that when you're asked something, when you're asked a question, or when you need to think about something, or when you need to retrieve information, you're gonna do so by starting somewhere in the network and then information will spread throughout the network. They differ in terms of how the information is assumed that you organize it, how it's assumed that you organize information in your semantic memory. This model assumes that you play a high premium to efficiency. The only thing that matters about canaries and the only thing that distinguishes canaries from the other birds, in this case, the distinguishing characteristics, uh, they sing and they're yellow. There's other birds that sing and there's other birds that, that are yellow, but that's a particular thing that you might think that's important to remember when you think about canaries. The fact that canaries have wings and can fly wouldn't necessarily be a fact that you store together. In other words, if this were a proposition, you wouldn't keep that proposition. You don't need to because all you need to know is that canaries are birds and bird keeps track, your concept of bird keeps track of all of the things that are true of birds. So that's an efficient model. Rather than remembering that canaries have wings, you just remember that canaries are birds. As long as you can get from canary to birds, you can, you've got all the information about birds that you know. So that's what the hierarchical model uh, has that the others don't. Uh, it makes the assumption that uh, level two and level three have progressively more abstract or high level uh, features. Everything that's true about bird here has wings is true of all of the other uh, underlying birds. Obviously there are some exceptions. Ostrich can't fly. So it has to store a specific piece of information. Ostriches can't fly, right? So it has that exceptional information encoded. So that's the hierarchical model. It does a really good job of making predictions about how people answer uh, questions about propositions. Uh, the spreading activation model does the same, but the spreading activation model doesn't assume that you remember this information hierarchically. Uh, it assumes that you represent the information in clusters. Uh, essentially, it's remembering the same, it's a, assuming that you remember the same kinds of information. If you're asked about uh, fire engines are red, you're gonna do it faster than asked about fire engines uh, are a kind of, you know, have a feature that trucks have. So fire engines have four or, you know, some number of tires. Uh, that would be a feature that's stored somewhere else. So it's gonna make the same predictions in terms of reaction time. It's just not making the assumption of hierarchical structure. Propositional network kind of does the same thing too, uh, except it stores everything within a densely interconnected uh, set of propositions, each one of these being facts and each fact having different characteristics like uh, dogs chew bones uh, versus dogs are animals. Uh, your dog is a dog. Uh, so there's different kinds of relationships. Uh, that's sort of encoded here, but it's not made as, as explicitly clear. So all of these models assume spreading activation. They all assume that you represent semantic information that your semantic organ, uh, rep memory is organized in some way. It's organized around things uh, that are similar. So you organize concepts based on conceptual and perceptual similarity. You can do that hierarchically, you can do that in a network, or you can do that by uh, propositions. Did that, does that help a little bit? Good, other questions? So fan effect, I don't have a specific slide on the fan effect, but the fan effect is one uh, that's predicted really well by these models, in particular this uh, model here. And the basic idea of fan effect is if information spreads everywhere, the more that information spreads, the harder it gets to determine which one of those uh, connections is the one that you're trying to remember. So information activation fans out in all directions and you wanna to try to remember a particular connection, uh, you've gotta distinguish it from all of the other places where the information has fanned out. And that was discovered in that uh, study that we talked about, which suggested that if people are learning a bunch of statements, uh, they'll be more likely to make errors on statements that have uh, nodes or concepts that come up in lots of different ways. So remember there was a study where people had to learn sentences 
sometimes a sentence had to do with hippies in the park or hippies in the cave or whatever it was, right? So hippies, there were three different kinds of hippies and there were three different kinds of people in the cave or something like that. Uh, and so you made errors when there were lots of repetitions, even though they were all individual uh, propositions, they were individual propositions that used the same facts. And that's where the mistakes were made. So the fan effect suggests that if you fan in from uh, spreading activation fans out, it's harder to distinguish an individual pairing when you're trying to remember it. So it's a way to predict kind of the types of errors that people make. Yes. Uh, could you go over low-level and high-level vision? So low-level and high-level vision. So the best distinction between low-level and high-level vision is low-level vision uh, typically refers to the things that are outside of the semantic aspect of visual processing. So in other words, the edge detectors, uh, the uh, parts of the eye, uh, receptive fields, uh, and those types of things. That would be considered low-level vision. So all of the visual processing that's done before you recognize an object. Once we talk about object recognition, uh, so recognizing uh, you know, cup, plates from cups or something like that, uh, that includes an additional piece for knowledge. Uh, and so that's what it usually referred to as high level vision. So it's taking the features and putting them together to recognize an object. Do you consider like low level being like more like bottom up and then <laughs> yeah, exactly. So low level would refer to those bottom up processes uh, and high level uh, would have an influence of top down processing so your knowledge plays a role here as well. Yeah. Yes. So in that case, so the question was uh, in that word recognition example where it's CQRN, but you might misread it as the word corn. Uh, in that case, uh, top-down processing uh, is filling in uh, for what seems like a mistake from bottom-up information. Uh, so you get rid of the stuff that doesn't fit with everything else. Uh, your top-down processing, your word recognition system uh, is giving you a lot of information uh, and a lot of suggestion that the word corn is the one that's reading. And so you eliminate or you ignore the information that's inconsistent with that. So that's an example of top-down processing. Any other questions that you sort of want to ask? Yeah. I guess not. No, it turns out I didn't ask any questions about neurons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's another good example of where there was like a whole big chunk of information. And then when I finally looked at the exam that I created, I realized I hadn't used any questions on that. So the study guide, by the way, is something that uh, reflects the types of things that are specifically on the exam, not exclusively, uh, but that's a good example. So good question. Yeah. I guess not. Yeah. So I... I mean, yes, you should know it, but it just turns out there aren't any clear questions on the exam about that. I mean, I want you to know all of this stuff and we talked about it and certainly knowing this stuff is going to increase your semantic knowledge. It's going to contribute to a more densely semantic, you know, densely connected semantic information or semantic network. Uh, it's gonna give context for all of this information, uh, but it isn't one that I've emphasized on the exam. Knowing it won't hurt, but not knowing it won't hurt much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the preferred, so the preferred pattern of input that leads to firing would be a better way to say it. Yes. Yes, exactly. The preferred the preferred pattern of input that leads to firing. Yeah. So examples of late, early, and attenuation. So examples of early selection would be things like from that dichotic listening experiment. Uh, in the dichotic listening experiment, the early selection model worked really well to explain why people would be able to tell if the, if the sound that they were, un the unattended channel was speech or non-speech, because that's physical characteristics. Uh, but it didn't do a very good job of explaining whether or not people would uh, follow the meaning if it switched to a different ear. Uh, following the meaning if it switched to a different ear 
uh, can be handled by the attenuation model because it would suggest that information, meaning-based information also gets through. And as long as it's enough to let you switch over, you can then follow the information that comes from the other bit. Uh, a late selection model would suggest that all of that information comes in uh, and then you put it together afterwards based on what makes the most sense, based on the mental model that you've built. Central executive would have to play a role in that late selection model because you have to determine uh, what, what information matches with the uh, existing mental representation that you're constructing. Uh, so, yeah. So, yeah, the question is about physical characteristics in er early and late. So physical characteristics can be used in early selection uh, to determine what gets through. Uh, if it doesn't have the right physical characteristics, you don't pay it any mind, it doesn't have any activation, it's not possible for you to uh, process it further. Physical characteristics in late selection or in attenuation uh, would involve how you run the attenuation system. So you use for physical characteristics to ramp up the, pro you know, to sort of ramp up the intensity of the signal or to turn down the intensity of the signal in the attenuation model. Or you could use physical characteristics to base your selection afterwards. The thing is with the late selection model, you can also use semantic characteristics uh, to make the selection. Preferred pattern of input, preferred pattern of activation on the, on the information that's coming in. So preferred pattern of input. So center on is information coming in, that's center on as opposed to center off is information coming in of a different pattern. Does that help? So Treisman's feature integration theory is the theory that suggests that we use these basic perceptual features. Uh, we perceive each one of them separately. Uh, so things that, and this maps onto those uh, feature detectors in uh, some of the simple complex and hypercomplex cells. So you've got uh, neuron or clusters of neurons or networks of neurons that respond to lines, lines of different orientation, lines of different length, lines of different movements, uh, different kinds of color. All of those are basic perceptual features that you have uh, feature detectors for. In Treisman's theory, she suggests that those things are first perceived separately, right? Features are just perceived separately. You haven't connected them yet to the objects. They have to be integrated before they can be connected to objects. And that takes a little extra time. And so the support for that theory comes from those feature detection uh, experiments where you can make the determination quicker when it's only a single feature difference, like just color. Uh, if the determination for the object that you're trying to recognize requires an integration of features, so the red triangle in a field of uh, different colored triangles and different colored squares requires the integration of two features. It takes longer. Yes, oh. also, exactly. Is it like related to the theory on determination? Right? No, same person, different theory. Yeah, yeah. Uh, verbal and spatial attention. Uh, so that was this experiment here. So um, this one? Yeah, so in this case, uh, just reviewing this study again, uh, the sentence condition, or what is referred to down here as the referent, uh, is a verbal uh, input. So you read the sentence, and then you say it back to yourself using an inner voice. Uh, and as you're saying it back to yourself, you pay attention to each, each word. And as you pay attention to each word, you also answer a question about the word that is language-based, right? So is it a noun or not? So everything about this condition uh, is very verbal. You're memorizing a sentence. You're saying the sentence back to yourself, and then you're looking at each word, and you're answering a question about the word that also includes knowledge about words. Um, in the image condition, you, write, you memorize an image, and then you imagine a visual spatial uh, uh, trajectory. Uh, so you imagine this line, this asterisk moving. So you're sort of using your visual imagery to imagine spatial motion. And then you're answering questions about spatial location. So it's a very spatially based task, a visual spatial task. So sentence is verbal, visual spatial uh, is visual spatial. Sorry, did you just go over the Jacobi and Dallas perceptual finding study? Yes, in a second I will. I wanted to just uh, answer the rest of this one then, Jacobi and Dallas uh, perceptual priming. Uh, nope, that's okay. Um, so 
where where did I leave off now? I don't remember. Oh, I left. <laughs> sorry, just I left off here uh, with this being all verbal, this being all spatial, and then you'll see that the other key thing here is that the response mechanism. One of them is very spatially relevant, so pointing back and forth. The other one is very verbally relevant, saying yes or no. When they use the same pool, there's a conflict and it takes you longer because you need to switch. Uh, when they use different pools, it takes you less long because there's not as much conflict because you don't have to switch within the same pool. Does that seem clear? Uh, Jacoby and Dallas perceptual priming experiment. Uh, so several different uh, uh, perceptual priming experiments. I don't have a particular slide uh, for the Jacoby and Dallas one. The Jacoby and Dallas one, I think, is the one with the typical with the generation effect. That's right. So uh, in both of those studies, uh, so both of the Jacobi and Dallas studies, one is a generation effect, uh, the other one is a perceptual priming effect. Uh, in both of these studies, participants are presented with a list of words. Uh, and the list of words would be presented with the subject, uh, asking them to later recognize the words. In the perceptual priming experiments, whether it's the generation effect priming, uh, or any of the other priming effects. The other one I think was a uh, level of processing effect. Uh, when there's a match between the, the, the perceptual characteristics of the word that they're trying to learn, uh, and then the identification later, you would see a priming effect. Uh, so if you saw the word in all capital letters, you're not gonna necessarily do very good at learning it explicitly because that doesn't encourage level of process, you know, a deeper level of processing. But if you see the word in capital letters later and you have to identify it in its degraded form, then there's a match, right? So then paying attention to the structure actually helps because it's the perceptual characteristics that drive that kind of perceptual repetition priming. Does that make sense? Okay, excellent. Got a few more minutes, yeah. Uh, so differentiation between a concept and a category, the two terms uh, are used kind of interchangeably. So I use them interchangeably a lot, but I usually try to differentiate between the two of them uh, by assuming that a category refers to the grouping of things. And the concept refers to the mental representation for that grouping of things. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. So we wouldn't choose. So, the, so what you said was that uh, early selection, you don't choose what you want to select. You do choose it, but you only choose it based on things that don't have any meaning. So you would choose it based on uh, physical characteristics. So you might say, I'm only going to pay attention to everything that's in this ear. So that would be the only choice you would have. Uh, you wouldn't be able to pay attention to it based on meaning. You would only pay attention to it based on where it's coming from. Yes, that's exactly right. So these would be things that we have a biological system uh, like uh, you know, a feature detector system. Uh, so the types of things that we can detect at a low level, uh, we should be able to, to tune to them. Yes. Attenuation is kind of in between. So attenuation models suggest that lots of information, lots, a lot more information gets through to central processing than you might realize. Uh, but what you're not paying attention to is not very active. Uh, and the, view, the features that we would use to turn down the activation level would be those percep perceptual features that are used in the early selection model. So imagine if the early selection model worked with those physical characteristics, but instead of blocking everything, it just let a little bit of that information in. So it's not a total screen, it's just a turning down of that channel. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right, so here, if I ask questions about dorsal and ventral, uh, it might be things like seeing an object and not knowing how to pick it up. That would be damage uh, to that dorsal pathway. Seeing an object and knowing how to pick it up but not knowing the name, uh, that would be that ventral pathway. Or seeing an object and only being able to name it 
once you've pick it up, picked it up, suggests damage here uh, and not damage here. So that kind of distinction between the two. Yeah. Yeah, so suppose there was damage to the dorsal pathway. So a participant or a patient with damage to this dorsal pathway might show deficits in being able to uh, locate the object uh, spatially when they reach for it, or they might show deficits in being able to uh, calibrate the grasp when they pick something up. But they'd be able to name the object because they would still have this uh, ventral pathway preserved. So this is the name pathway. If that's damaged, then access to names uh, is damaged. If this pathway is damaged, then access to the correct grasp uh, or the correct motor action would be damaged. And so if the like in edges that, because it talks a bit more about like mental pathway damage and then talking yeah. about how, um, like you can localize it, um, like if it's both occurs, does the same kind of pathway, I guess, apply if they're damaged to certain pathways? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's definitely questions. So uh, if you didn't hear, the question is what I ask about things like different kinds of agnosia. There's definitely a question or two uh, on the midterm about different kinds of agnosia, for sure. I Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how I phrased it. No, I can't remember exactly how I phrased them, but there are questions that would ask you to distinguish between prosopagnosia uh, and apperceptive agnosia, for example. Yeah, so knowing the difference between those kinds. Yeah, so the differences between the different kinds of agnosia, apperceptive agnosia assumes that the damage happens earlier uh, because you can't, apperceptive means non-perceptive. Uh, so non-perceptive agnosia means that the damage is in the ability to create a stable perceptual representation. You don't even get a chance to come up with a name because you're not able to put a stable perceptual representation together. So damage occurs lower, earlier in the system. And the symptoms that you would see would be if people are asked to compare two objects that are presented visually, they might not be able to tell the difference. Or they, were the one, they would be the ones that wouldn't be able to create a very detailed drawing because they're not able to get all of that information stably represented. Individuals with the associative form of agnosia uh, don't seem to have damage at that uh, visual area. Uh, so they can tell the difference between two objects when they see them. Uh, they can draw the details on an object and they can see if there's missing information, uh, all of that. So perceptually, there isn't a problem. They just can't come up with a name. Uh, so if you have uh, associative agnosia, your visual perceptual system isn't necessarily damaged. It's the linking to the name that seems to be damaged. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Correct. Right. Right. So. So semantic priming in this case would be in that case was worse because the conditions that uh, the, con the conditions that facilitated perceptual priming were the conditions that also uh, encouraged uh, a shallower level of processing. Uh, and so those, for those conditions, memory was, was reduced. Uh, the conditions that encouraged deeper levels of processing were the ones that did not encourage uh, perceptual priming. So there was a difference, uh, a, a different pattern uh, for both of those. That's right. Right. So the perceptual prime doesn't work if they're given the perceptual. They're given the uh, if they're asked to pay attention to the deeper level of processing. Uh, there's additional perceptual information there. Yeah. So in in, in that case, uh, so, right? Exactly. So if you were just paying attention to the word itself and the form of the word. Uh, perceptual priming would be enhanced. If you're paying attention to the meaning of the word, perceptual priming isn't enhanced, but uh, recognition memory would be enhanced because of the level of processing effect. You are, uh, that's right. Um, but you may also be paying attention to other information, like 
the, does it fit the sentence, uh, for example. So if you have to think about how it fits in a sentence, uh, then there's more perceptual information on that encoding condition than on the retrieval condition or on the implicit retrieval condition. Uh, that's right, that's right. In for the perceptual priming, yes, you would see as long as you see the word and there's a direct match between the encoding and the uh, prime the identification, uh, you would see a stronger priming effect. You're still seeing it, but you're seeing other things too. You're seeing the rest of the sentence uh, context. So you're seeing the word, but lots of other words too. Uh, that would detract from the priming effect, yes. It is a bit. <laughs> uh, it does detract from the priming effect because when you're asked to sort of identify a single word, it's just the single word in that single form. Uh, and so additional information doesn't help. Uh, that's shown better, though, I think, by that generation effect. Uh, the generation effect study is the one where level of processing is enhanced when you don't see the word at all. Uh, when you, yes. That's right. That's right. I think I've got it. It would help if I had the slide in front of me. Yes. Which studies? Um, uh, let me see here. Tell me which studies you wanted to review. Uh, so cognitive, so for those two studies, uh, so the one was using uh, ERP and the other one was using FNIRS. Uh, so for those, I can go through them, but I don't ask about those particular studies on the exam. Uh, what I would recommend that you know is the difference between ERP, EEG, FNIRS, fMRI, and so on. So know how those two things work. Though, both of those studies were used as illustrations to talk about why uh, why that particular methodology might be used. I'm happy to go through them, but I will say that I'm not asking any particular questions about those two studies. Okay, yes. So I'm not sure if ERP is basically like the speed of someone's reaction to a stimulus, right? And that's yes. like the ones that measure electrical impulses like EEG measure. Right? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, and, the, and EEG is just measuring all of the electrical activity. ERP is using electrical activity and then pegging it to a specific event. Uh, and that's what the E and event and the ERP is for event. Exactly. So I'm gonna wrap up the general question and answer period. Uh, if anyone has very specific questions, I can answer those before uh, between now and 4.30. So if you have a very specific question and you just wanna ask me personally, uh, we can do that for the next few minutes. Does that sound good? I'm going to be on Teams too. So if you got other questions, I'm happy to answer them on Teams. Uh, let me go ahead and stop the share and then I'll answer some specific questions. Otherwise, good luck, everyone. I'll see you here on Wednesday. Hold on for a sec. I'm just going to stop this.